Well, hi, everyone, and uh, thank you for having me. Excited to be here. So I'm Artie Starr. Um, I've been a software engineer for about 20 years and also an artist. I do acrylic painting and then also 2D and 3D animation. I've also had this gravity to research for a long time, um, wanting to pioneer new ground in our discipline. And so then when this whole pandemic thing happened, I thought, hey, grad school, that sounds like fun. And so now I'm doing a PhD at University of Victoria. And I'm also a researcher at the Computer Human Interaction and Software Engineering Lab Chisel at University of Victoria with the incredible Dr. Margaret Ann Story. So super grateful to be here. Um, my research is focused on developing a theory of momentum in software development and how we can measure the experience of friction and flow, which you'll hear a bit more about today. So I want to talk a little bit about grad school because it's not really what I expected at all. So I think about my undergrad where I was like trying to finish my coursework and get my degree and get out of school as quickly as possible. And then this has been the opposite. It's like slow down and take your time to dig deeply into something you're genuinely passionate about and explore all these new ideas and have fun too. I think that's been one of the most important parts. Um, so my courses have been really amazing. And one of the coolest opportunities has been learning about this whole field of HCI, human computer interaction, which I've been mind blown ever since I started exploring this stuff. So Douglas Engelbart is best known for pioneering the field of human computer interaction. And his first, his best known invention is the computer mouse. So if you think about before we had a computer mouse and kicking back and thinking about how can humans potentially communicate with the machine to explain these ideas and things that they're pointing to, you know, and then coming up with this concept of a computer mouse, that's what HCI is. It's, it's developing and thinking about these foundational interfaces that we have where humans can interface and communicate with a machine and thinking about how we can design that. And it just expands the boundaries of your imagination when you extend it to reimagining the potential interfaces that we might have. So he wrote this paper that I would highly encourage you to check out, improving our ability to improve a call for investment in a new future. And one of the big ideas in the paper is this contrast between augmentation and automation, and that we ought to focus on augmenting our human ability to solve problems. So augmentation is building a tool like a shovel that helps us dig, whereas automation is building a digging machine. Automation takes an existing process and then offloads the responsibility to a computer, whereas augmentation gives us the capability to solve problems that we couldn't solve before. So today, I wanna to talk about some of the biggest problems in software development and how we can augment our ability to solve them. So first, what's the problem? So in a recent study by Stripe, developers were spending 42% of their time in an average week troubleshooting bad code. 42%, that's a lot, right? So Hans Doctor, founder of Gradle, gave this amazing keynote last year at the DPE Summit on the neuroscience behind developer productivity engineering, where he, he talks about this problem in terms of cognitive fatigue and why tackling and reducing, reducing troubleshooting time specifically is so important. These frustrating experiences of being confused and stuck is what wears down our capacity to do productive work. And yet still, it's difficult for this problem to get the attention it deserves because it's largely invisible to the business. So let's put this in economic terms. Companies in the US waste $634 billion per year on software projects when developers get confused and stuck. The impact of these problems is huge. The straight paper suggests this developer coefficient has a $3 trillion impact on global GDP. But despite the huge impact here, because these human factors are invisible, they're hard to measure and hard to explain, across the industry, this is still one of the biggest challenges we face. So even if we decide we wanna fix this, how do we know what to fix? 
how do we how do we identify specifically what we should do to make things better? So 30 years ago, Ward Cunningham shared this concept with the software community in 1992 at an Oopsla conference of technical debt. He says, shipping first time code is like going into debt. A little debt speeds development so long as it's paid back promptly with a rewrite. The danger occurs when the debt is not repaid. So after 30 years, I, I, I assume most of you are probably familiar with this metaphor by now. And then over the last 30 years, this technical debt concept has become so pervasive in our thinking that we use it to explain all our software problems, even when the cause of the problems has nothing to do with short-term trade-off decisions to speed up delivery, as Cunningham described. And while this certainly has made a difference in getting our managers to care about these problems, modern software projects have also become increasingly complex with the popularity of microservices architectures, microservice architectures, uh, cloud native platforms, and then the move away from single executable monolith applications. And developers still spend countless hours confused and stuck troubleshooting, but the causes of these difficulties have shifted dramatically with these architectural shifts from being predominantly inside the code written by developers to this complex integration space of different libraries, frameworks, and now a network of microservices. So we think about software 30 years ago versus software today. And, you know, I was thinking 30 years ago, that's like the early 90s, right? What were we doing then? And we had a lot of desktop apps. And then it was like the, the early years of, of the internet. We were doing the server-side web apps and our early browser apps. This is kind of where our development was. And then you think about today, we've got continuous delivery, microservices, cloud native platforms. And you know these problems aren't really inside the code in the same way anymore. Think about how these changes have shifted our fundamental architectures and how the complexity has really drifted to the integration space. And we really need a more holistic view of the causes of software problems in order to account for all the complexity of potential causes that can exist outside of the technical debt metaphor. Otherwise, we're gonna miss stuff. So what exactly is missing from the picture? If we think about what's missing, we've got existing tools that can help us see complexities inside the code. And what we're missing is the ability to see the complexities of understanding the runtime behaviors as we change our code. So if you think about when you put electricity through the system and you've got these behaviors that are observable on the screen, and then we're trying to build a mental model of how the code basically causes these various behaviors and stuff that we see. And then as we're changing the code and see changes in the behavior, we're trying to put a mental model of how all those things relate. This electricity through the system perspective is kind of missing when we're only looking at the things in the code. And also these human factors of all the different folks on our team, the different mental models and familiarity that we have, all of these human factors also come into play. And we don't really have a good way to put a scope around those things to see what's going on and take those factors into account when we try and make decisions about where our problems are and what we should fix. And then there's also this wrench now thrown into the software engine. So does this seem accurate? So we've got developers coding, for a couple hours and then debugging for about six hours. And then chat GPT, yay, is gonna generate our code for us. It takes five minutes. And now we spend all day troubleshooting. So 24 hours, I don't know if this is exactly accurate, but I think the sentiment of it is, is, in, the right, is in the right place um, of, of this huge skew of how long it, it starts to take us to debug these things and shifting where our time goes. And what's the impact of us not having that mental model in our head from writing the code to begin with? Like this is where we feel the impact of these things. And I also wanna mention this troubleshooting and debugging effort is also when we experience all this cognitive fatigue. And it's also more of this invisible impact that the business doesn't really see. 
So if we're still trying to see our modern day problems through this lens of technical debt that doesn't really fit the characteristics of the type of problems that we're experiencing in modern day software development, we're gonna miss what is actually going on. So what we really wanna understand is what's causing the slowdowns that are affecting developer experience in the here and now. And using Engelbart's question, another way to look at it, you know, how do we improve our ability to improve? So what I want to do is talk about a augmentation strategy in terms of a design concept, theory, and vision, and then the beginning of a concrete implementation. So first to start out, I want to show you a video demo of a project I built for my HCI design course, where we had to invent a new support tool using Arduino um, electronics programming, physical, prototype, physical prototyped materials, and then some kind of software programming to invent some new HCI support tool. Imagine you're a software developer working from home on a software team of eight people. You've got a retrospective meeting with your team today to talk about what are the biggest pain points experienced by the team and what are the best opportunities for improvement. To help ground the discussion in empirical data and provide insight into where those opportunities might be, you and your team members pop on your AR sunglasses and enter the AR code planetarium. As you look around you, you see code constellations like stars in the sky representing the different code files and relationships in your code base. A few of the key classes are labeled in the constellations to help you orient yourself to the sky. The code constellations are based on how the developers on the team navigate around the code. The more two files are looked at together, the closer they are pulled together in a force-directed graph. Similar to the idea in Janice Singer's research paper on nav tracks, the implicit architecture of the code base is revealed as constellations. The handheld planetarium controller allows you to explore the code. To see the files in a constellation, you can look toward the area of interest and then turn the selection knob to scroll through each of the files. When you touch the friction button, the code constellations are overlaid with a red and orange heat map to indicate where the most friction and confusion has been experienced by the team. You notice a curious pattern where the areas of highest confusion tend to be at the hubs of the constellations. Next, you touch the flow button and the code constellations are overlaid with a purple heat map to indicate where the team has spent the most time changing the code. Again, you notice a pattern where the most deep violet areas seem to correspond to the tangles in the code constellations. During the retro meeting, you and your team talk about the different patterns you're seeing in the constellations and develop insights about where to investigate potential improvements. All right, so this was two years of real data from one of my code projects. And these code constellations are built from actual traversal patterns from navigating around the code in the IDE and then overlaid with developer experience data to show these hotspots. So I, I was actually really excited because I just threw all this data in these force directed graphs and didn't really know kind of what was going to happen. And I thought it was so amazing that just the natural patterns from navigating around the code base led to these really clear kind of constellation patterns of the relatedness of files in the architecture. So I wanna talk a little bit about this idea of using AR in a software engineering context. 
with most developers working from home these days, I think there's some really interesting opportunities here to explore. Um, so one of the things I was working on with my research was coming up with a, a workable strategy to make this work for developers, including myself. I figured if I wasn't willing to go and do, you know, put on some crazy headset or something, then then it wasn't it wasn't realistically going to work. So uh, I've been prototyping with the Xreal Air um, Air sunglasses, and I've switched from my kind of homemade little device you saw in the video to using a game controller. So these are my my cool AR shades here, and. I, I really like these actually, like they're, they're lightweight for, for one. So, um, you know, compared to putting a big headset on your head, um, like this is way more feasible to, to pop on in the middle of the day to do like, you know, specialized tasks or something. Um, and then I can also still see my, my, um, screen and things through my, my sunglasses. Um, and then, but, uh, because they're lightweight, they also don't have a whole lot of extra hardware on them. So these don't have any cameras on them. They don't have, um, spatial compute so that you can't take tea teapots and set them on tables and things like that. Um, so, uh, they're a lot lighter partially because they don't have a bunch of batteries and, you know, extra hardware and things that, um, generate a lot of, you know, heat and create bulk and weight and stuff as well. So what they do do really well, though, is you've got a, a stereoscopic uh, three-dimensional display um, that is about the size of a, like a home theater screen. You can actually watch movies on these pretty, pretty well. It works pretty great. And the, the screen is really bright, high refresh rate. Um, and, and then, um, and then you've got three degrees of freedom, which basically it's like uh, things stabilize in space. So if I, I can orient towards my computer and then I can say have things sitting on my left or my right that I could maybe have like a elaborate visualization that I could I could check out uh, while I'm I'm working or integrated with my um, coding to to help me solve some specific problem that a 3D visualization might help with um, the 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 game controller the reason i went this direction um like i'm one of those developers that doesn't really like touching my mouse <laughs> like if i can do everything with a keyboard and navigate everything to hotkeys that's awesome so with this whole idea of that we're going to take a, a a pointer and like try and point at 3d objects in space it's even more difficult i found than trying to to use um, a mouse to point at things. And for kind of things that you want to do speedily and stuff, um, I found it quite frustrating. Similarly with um, trying to do hand gestures and the strategy of, of um, having cameras and moving your hands around in order to, to gesture things um, for, for like an output that, or for an input that has um, uh, like a, a gradient to it, like you want to do some scale or something, gesturing that kind of motion, uh, makes sense. But for something like a binary input, like for the pushing of a button uh, or uh, some kind of simple one bit input, um, having to do a hand gesture in order for that to get interpreted is a whole lot of work. And then, you're, then your arms actually get quite tired. And so I started um, thinking about and prototyping with kind of alternative handheld physical devices for interacting with AR. And then I ended up switching to a Bluetooth game controller that could integrate with it and as kind of the base device. And one of the things is, or one of the reasons is that the population of developers uh, probably overlaps pretty significantly with the popular, uh, the, the um, population of people that play um, video games. And so most developers are probably pretty familiar with how to use a game controller like this already. And it works quite uh, well for uh, navigating around a, a, a digital space and giving you a variety of, of controls that are right at your fingertips. So um, I, I'm, I'm thinking that if we um, set aside the um, idea of augmented reality as needing to integrate with our um, reality around us and instead go instead look at what um, 
what technology we already have right now that's that's really great um, of having a a 3D holographic display that we can navigate with a game controller that stays stable in space and we can interact with it easily. I think if we just roll with that, um, we can build some really cool applications. Um, and I'm not sure there's really a whole lot of use cases for being able to set teapots on tables and things and having that integration. I know there's some, but um, we can do a lot already with what we have. And um, even if we find ways to solve that problem well with the AR spatial um, integration, it's, um, it's processor intensive, which means it's heat intensive and battery intensive and has all these other challenges that come with us, which is, which is why you know, we've, we've got um, $3,500 devices as, as competitive products. So, so these sunglasses are like 300 bucks. So um, it makes um, the whole setup significantly more uh, feasible, I think. So it's one area that I think is worth exploring of um, ways that we can leverage the affordances of this type of technology to build some really cool, supportive, um, three-dimensional visualizations um, to help us uh, support our work. And moving on to the theory side of things. So I think one way we can think about this as two sides of developer productivity engineering. So we talked about uh, cognitive fatigue, and this is this side of friction. And the opposite side being flow, the main concept I wanna talk about today is this concept of momentum and how we can get a scope and better understanding of um, how do we optimize momentum and get in flow more easily as well. So really what I'm talking about here is this paradigm shift uh, from technical debt to thinking about friction in our programming flow. Um, and I qualify this on purpose because friction implies a stuckness relative to some kind of movement. So in order to understand friction, we really need to understand flow. So this is shifting from a code-oriented perspective to a developer experience oriented perspective as our main paradigm that we see these problems through. So let's define some terms around this stuff and see if we can be more precise in what we mean and what we're trying to measure. So first, this idea of programming flow. So programming flow is the developer's experience as they interact with the code, the thinking, understanding, modifying, and testing of the code in order to make the behavior of the system match an intention. Programming flow is the developer's experience as they interact with the code, the thinking, understanding, modifying, and testing of the code in order to make the behavior of the system match an intention. So we're flowing toward an intention. And all of those activities that we do are supporting us moving toward that intention, okay? So I'm kind of a visual person. <laughs> so this is how I kind of conceptualize this idea of programming flow. We have this idea seed that we grow into a target intention. And thinking about that as, as opposed to a straight line, it's kind of like a surface area that we're um, uh, growing into this space and we're observing what's going on and making adjustments as, as you know, we work on getting the idea to match whatever our um, intended outcome is. So this main concept is flowing toward, flow is toward an intention. Now momentum is something that builds up over time with focused attention. So I think about how this happens in stages. So first is this stage where initially we don't really have a plan. We're absorbing inputs, thinking about the strategy, no real coding yet, kind of looking around at the code, trying to figure out what we're gonna do. Um, and then we have this 
a eureka moment where we have a, a breakthrough insight about what our coding strategy is going to be, where a plan comes to mind as, as how we're going to approach the task. And then over here, we've got a clear vision and strategy. We see the steps on and the way to go and, and we're doing it. We're making it happen. So the reason I have a, um, a, 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 uh, cliff up here too. This So this top line, um, you can think of as this max focus depth or total absorption in the, ta in the, in the task, um, which corresponds to this concept of, of uh, Mihai Csikszentmihalyi's concept of flow state. When we're so fully focused and in the zone, completely absorbed in our task, and a big part of that as well is this clear vision and strategy um, that is critical to getting into getting the momentum going. So my belief is the amount of thought work we're able to achieve within a given amount of time corresponds to the depth of momentum achieve we've achieved. That is, uh, we get faster and more efficient as we get the momentum going. So if you think about that, what's the impact of interruptions? If we've got this exponential effect with regards to getting in focus, getting the momentum going, and then we get interrupted in the middle of that, what happens? So I'm sure you've experienced this where, you know, you're working on something and you get interrupted and then, you know, you have to come back and remember what you're doing again. So one of the uh, other projects I did in my um, uh, HCI course was this momentum physicalization device. And I, I did this project with a, a friend of mine, uh, Ben, and um, I'll just let you watch the video and then we can talk about it a little bit. Imagine you are a software project manager with a software team of eight people and you are responsible for scheduling meetings for your team. Your team has a number of key deliverables coming up and you don't want to negatively impact the team's productivity with too many meetings. But despite your best efforts, the developers on the team are frustrated and scheduling a meeting to talk about the meetings. As you walk into the meeting room, on the center of the table, the developers have placed a momentum physicalization device. The data physicalization is designed to help you acquire an intuitive understanding of the relationship between scheduling meetings and the impact on developer productivity. First, you examine the two wooden chart cartridges that contrast developer momentum for a single day with and without meetings. Then you place the chart with no meetings into the cartridge slot and press the run simulation button. You see the wooden worker building up speed and typing very quickly. The overall momentum for the day is summarized on the display. Next, you place the chart with two meetings in the cartridge slot and press the run simulation button again. This time, you see the wooden worker typing very slowly on the keyboard. Then he's interrupted and types again, but is unable to build up speed. The overall momentum for the day is again summarized on the display. Then the team asks, based on what you're learning here about developer momentum, if you needed to schedule a meeting, what would be the best time to do it to minimize the impact on developer productivity? Maybe we should schedule our meetings first thing in the morning or right after lunch. That would probably be significantly less disruptive to momentum. The manager now has an intuitive sense for how scheduling decisions will impact the team's momentum and starts to make better overall decisions that keep his team happy. All right, so I wanna mention again, um, this is real data 
for developer momentum, co contrasting a day with and without meetings. And then um, the line charts you saw, saw there, we, we laser cut into wood and then built this little little um, wooden worker guy that we pair, uh, powered up with the Arduino kid, uh, tool, uh, bleh, the Arduino um, uh, programming and built out the little wooden worker and everything. Super fun project. Um, this is the kind of cool stuff I get to do in, in grad school now. Um, uh, anyway, though, um, the the idea, though, I mean, uh, if you've ever been interrupted versus uh, having a, a full day where you can focus and get the momentum going and then you just have a couple of meetings and then you're like, oh, I, you know, you have a few hours scattered here and there, but it becomes really difficult to get anything done. You like lose the whole day when you have a couple of meetings sometimes because you can't get the momentum going. So once we start looking at things this way, not as just two hours is two hours, it's we have to take into, into account the time it takes us to focus and build up momentum and get to that uh, focus depth in order to really get that, that speed and productivity going. So kind of to summarize um, characteristics of flow. So flow is toward an intention and then momentum depends on these eureka moments where we gain clarity of strategy and vision. So the important thing here to remember is that going for walks, um, stepping away from our computer, uh, um, playing ping pong, taking a shower, you know, whatever it is you need to do to um, uh, stop focusing on your main task so you can kind of get that uh, default network background processing going. Uh, is is really important actually to our ability to develop a coding strategy. So we input lots of information and sometimes stepping away is the most effective way to get momentum going. Um, and then momentum builds with focus and we get faster and more efficient as we get the momentum going. So this, this is alluding to that um, uh, thought thought work efficiency that happens as we build that deeper level of focus and it has a significant impact on our over, overall productivity of what we're able to accomplish. All right, so that's the flow side. So what is friction? So friction then is everything that gets in the way of the flow towards your intention. And I'm defining this broadly on purpose because I think it's an area of research in itself to understand all the different types of friction. So we're gonna focus on one specific type of friction, confusion. So confusion occurs when a developer first writes code, then observes unexpected behavior when running code. When developers are confused, they troubleshoot to resolve the confusion. So this is also when this strong cognitive fatigue comes in is when we're in the state of confusion. So if you think about a day when you've been troubleshooting something like for several hours and how tiring that is, how frustrating it is, how cognitively fatiguing it is, um, you know, even after you figure it out, after you spend several hours trying to troubleshoot a problem, it's really hard to just like, you know, go back into getting momentum again, because you're exhausted. It, it takes all our energy away. It's cognitively fatiguing to be confused, especially for um, long amounts of time. So how do we measure uh, confusion? So a lot of the ideas from this come from my book, Idea Flow, How to Measure the Pain in Software Development. Um, and specifically, I was exploring strategies that we could visualize our experience with the code and thinking about the process of coding, like having a conversation. And then I came up with this technique of creating these flow maps. So I started keeping track of all my painful interaction with the code and visualizing it on a timeline like this. So the pain started when I ran into some unexpected behavior and then ended when the problem was resolved. So this is five hours and 18 minutes of troubleshooting. You probably all agree that's pretty painful, right? So if we think about this, these are bands of confusion time, okay? So if we want to understand what's causing all the confusion, 
we can break it down and kind of think about it like this as being driven by these two factors, the likeliness of unexpected behavior and the cost to troubleshoot and repair the problems. And so I wanted to understand what the causes of these confusions were. And so I started breaking down the problems into categories. And what I realized as I did this is most of the pain was actually caused by human factors as opposed to problems inside the code itself. So for example, stale memory mistakes. So this is when I have an idea in my head about how the code is supposed to work, but it doesn't work that way anymore because somebody changed it or ambiguous clues. This is when you're running an experiment and there's multiple possibilities for how behavior can occur and you make a bad assumption and down the rabbit hole you go, troubleshooting for hours. So these aren't really problems inside the code itself. Confusion occurs during the process of understanding and changing the software. And so I started thinking about how can we optimize this programming flow um, between the developer and the software as we, as we try and get the code to match our intention and the flow of ideas as we're kind of having this conversation as opposed to just optimizing the code itself. So this is uh, about all of these additional factors that we talked about, the human factors, these behavioral aspects of the software and how we build a mental model of the behavior and how that relates to the code that's creating those behaviors. So all of those additional aspects and how we, and focusing on that from a developer experience perspective as we're interacting with it. So kind of in summary, the, the, the big idea I wanna get across here of how to fix the right things as an augmentation strategy. So one, first, uh, visualize the developer's experience. For example, the experiences of being confused and stuck projected onto the code where the devs happen to be while the experience is happening. So this gives you a map of how the experiences of friction correlate with different areas of code so you can identify the highest leverage opportunities for improvement. And then next, discuss the factors that affect the experiences to get powerful insights into what, specific, uh, what specifically to improve. So when we ask a question like, what made troubleshooting take so long? It points your brain at all those runtime behavioral aspects of what happened and all the human factors like, what were your expectations? What did you see on the screen? What did you do to figure it out? And then you start thinking about, well, it was really difficult to see what was going on. Maybe we can build some tools to improve observability here. Or it was difficult to isolate the behavior I was trying to change. Maybe we can decouple the database code from the transform logic here to make this easier to test. So by understanding the factors that affect our experiences, we can identify the sorts of improvements that are really going to have an impact, the ones that help us uh, work through all these coding challenges more easily. So that's how you systematically optimize flow. So these are the two sides of developer productivity engineering. So the friction side with cognitive fatigue, and now you know more about this flow side and momentum. And if we think about both ways to reduce friction as well as optimize flow and momentum and help get our momentum going, we can really take our developer productivity engineering to a whole nother level. So next, I wanted to show you a concrete implementation of all the theory I pr just presented. Um, I think it would really help to tie all this together in your brains. And, and so you can see where this data comes from, um, how these models of uh, friction and flow can apply in practice um, and how these sorts of tools can help us um, optimize our programming flow in a practical everyday sort of way. Flow Insight is a console extension to your IDE uh, designed to help you stay in the zone, get the momentum going, as well as empower you to make data-driven decisions about where to improve. So it's if you press a the console from the top of your screen, 
And then what you see here is your flow for the week um, and your current flow state, and then um, your flow metrics for the week as well. And um, the visualization of your experience is represented in three colors. So learning, momentum, and confusion. So learning is this stage of absorbing input, thinking about strategy, kind of wandering around the code and looking at things, but not really doing any coding yet. And then momentum is represented as a gradient that builds up over time as you get the momentum going and get into coding. And then confusion, the red, is a percentage of your overall time during the day. And then the metrics over here, you can kind of choose the, the different game you want to play and, and select different ones. So uh, time to momentum so uh, is the average time it takes to get momentum going first thing in the morning. So this is measuring um, uh, the, the moment you kind of get, get started in the morning till how long it takes you to, to get into a, a coding flow. And then flow per day, this is the average time you spend in flow state uh, per day where momentum was sustained. So after you get in flow, um, how many hours are you in flow for? So, and you can, you can mouse over the different days. Um, I was mainly coding on Monday here. <laughs> um, and then other kinds of metrics that you have for this. Um, momentum per day. So this is measured in depth minutes. So this is that exponential perspective I was talking about. So the total momentum depth achieved by spending consecutive time in flow state. Um, and then longest flow streak. So the longest amount of time in flow state where momentum was sustained. Um, so first, let me just show you where this data is, is, is coming from. So it's not uh, so uh, mysterious. So inside um, the IDE is a, a Flow Insight plugin. So there's a Flow Insight metrics plugin that's available um, uh, to download on IntelliJ store in this case. Um, and then um, what the plugin does is if I go to the plugins directory here, you can see a, a plugin directory for IntelliJ. And what this is doing here, if I tail this active flow file, as we navigate around to different files in the code here, go and look at different things or we might modify some things, or we might run a test. All this activity gets tailed to this active flow file. So that's basically what any plugin, uh, so I've also got you know VS Code and Gradle here, but any plugin is basically just writing this streaming kind of JSON out in this flow format. And so you can see editor activity, we've got uh, the duration in seconds for how long you looked at a particular file, what the module name was, what the path to the particular file was, whether or not it was modified. And then the test we just ran, this shows up as execution activity. Um, so uh, we had um, nine seconds of uh, the, that the test took to run, uh, what the process name for it, the exit code. So this is how you can tell if the test passed or failed and the task type, which is JUnit, and whether or not um, you were uh, running the debugger. We've also got this modification activity, which counts the number of keystrokes in 30 second samples. And this is what the momentum is based off of. So can um, basically determines, are you looking around um, at files and stuff and not really typing anything? Um, and, or are you, are you typing at a pretty good clip? And it's set up to, so getting into a flow state is based on kind of a, um, a, a moving um, average of um, counting the total number of keystrokes in a, in a 20 minute window um, being over a threshold of, of 150. So once you're over the threshold, um, uh, you start building up momentum. <laughs> um, and um, so, uh, so if I go and look at, let's look back at one of these prior weeks where I have a little more exciting coding activity going on here. 
Okay, here we've got here we've got a good productive coding week here. So if I if I open up one of these flow maps, you can see kind of a visualization of the day. And these are these streaks of momentum kind of building up over time. So each one of these bars is 20 minutes. And then I mouse over them. I can see the, the names of the files I was working on during that time. And then here is um, some confusion I ran into. And I'll, I'll um, get into that in a sec of how that's recorded. And then these are um, time breaks. So taking breaks during the day. And it's all kind of put onto one timeline. And then you can see the specific things I was working on here. I'll show you where that comes from in a minute too. But you can see the momentum, what that looks like visualized in a day. So uh, the momentum physicalization of those uh, wooden charts and the little wooden worker was taking this information and mapping this to speed um, and then co contrasting a day um, where we were able to fully focus and work on coding all day versus a day that had a, a couple meetings interrupted and that difficulty of getting momentum going. All right, so now I wanna talk about these um, bands of uh, confusion a little bit. So the tools in the Flow Console are designed to integrate seamlessly with your workflow and support you in optimizing flow. So let me show you what I mean here. So let's say, you know, I'm, I'm writing some code. I've been working on this momentum stuff here. And then I run a test. And, ah, I got a failure here, right? So I, you know, I start looking at the error message. And sometimes when something breaks, we know immediately what's wrong. It's a thing that we just changed. But other times, you know, something will fail or something unexpected will happen. And we don't know what's going on. And we're pretty confused. Um, and, it, and it might take us a while to, to figure it out. So when we find ourselves in this moment, so one of the things I've been trying to do is like learn how to recognize these moments when when I'm confused and troubleshooting because these are uh, really key opportunities to um, to also reflect on later and understand where um, where we can um, make some improvements that'll make a big difference. So okay, so we're back here. Some unexpected thing happened, and we can go into our tools. And if we hit this little lightning bolt here, you get a big red button to start a troubleshooting session. So I click the big red button and then Furby comes up and says, what's the problem? So Furby in this context is like your little uh, rubber duck that you can, you can talk to to help you work through the problem and think through the problem systematically. So what I try and do here usually is to try and clarify what is the question on my mind I'm trying to answer. So I might not know what... Um, the the fixes for this yet but i can help my brain to think in the right direction by clarifying um the question and my expectations first so i might ask you know why isn't the ttm metric restarting or the task switch this was actually a problem i ran into recently okay so we've got these metric calculations I, I didn't get the answer back that I was expecting. So what was I expecting? So that might be another thing I might want to clarify in the, in the note, you know, like I was expecting momentum to reset to zero when I did a task switch. Okay. So the idea with the seamless integration here is as opposed to taking notes in another window which is often a flow breaking thing. Like if I have to go to some kind of text editor and stuff to be able to take notes in general, I just wouldn't do it. And so the flow console, you've got one hotkey and a console that integrates with your IDE. And, and so I can basically hit, uh, be in my IDE and typing. And then I hit the hotkey and I can take some notes and then I collapse the console and I'm back to my IDE. So the seamless integration makes it way easier to 
take notes and sort of think out loud as we're working in a way that I don't think was um, all that feasible before. Um, I mean, we could always open a text editor and stuff, um, but this also, this makes it way easier to, to, to do. Um, in the process of, of thinking through um, like what our assumptions are, what are the things we're thinking, like being able to use this as a way to sort of like think out loud um, uh, really helps us think through the problem more systematically and resolve these things sooner. So the other thing you'll see is, is this little floating focus bar window. So one of the other things that often happens is, is we, um, you know, we'll be spacing out, we're thinking about something else and we kind of forget what our focus was. So this is the focus bar that is sort of like a continuous reminder that you can drag kind of wherever you want that reminds you what your current focus was in the tool. So then you can also see I've, I've got this uh, timer here going um, um, that's keeping track of how long these troubleshooting sessions are all taking. And then when I solve the problem here and I hit solved, I get XP and I can level up my little Furby here. So this is Furby, um, he's your little furball friend um, and you can choose his colors. So if I want to maybe have a more of a blue furry um, and then change his shoes, maybe some turquoise shoes, huh? All right. And then you level up your Furby as you solve problems and use the tool and, and um, work on um, optimizing um, your momentum. Um, so with the troubleshooting, you know, we talked about the um, importance of discussing the factors that affect our experiences to get insights on what specifically to improve. So um, this gives you, this view gives you an overview of all of your troubleshooting sessions for the week. And this is sort of a, a 50 minute threshold here. And you can see what is the um, average time to uh, resolve the problems for the week. And the out of control, control ratio shows you how many of these things are over the line. So if we go back to some prior weeks here, we've got more interesting things going on. And then I can, I can click on these so you can mouse over and look at what the different troubleshooting sessions were. Um, any of the red ones will also show up on this list. So these are sorted in time descending order across all time. And then any of the red ones here will show up in that list too. So I can click on this. So it's why isn't the, the me status panel loading up by default? So this was a real thing I ran into. And so then you can review your notes for your troubleshooting session and what happened. You can see things like the particular files that you executed, or, or I'm sorry, the files that you were um, editing during the time that you were troubleshooting. Um, any tests, I don't have any in this particular one. Um, and then um, you can put tags on things um, as well. Um, so this particular issue, you can scroll down to the bottom. I'm like, okay, I figured it out. There are two places the state for the menu page is set. One in the console layout and one from the side panel view controller, which handles overall settings and, and comms for all the menus. So, so I ended up running into a bug that was tricky to figure out because there was two copies of the state of where this information was. And I was editing essentially the wrong one. I wasn't the editing the one that was actually controlling the behavior. I was editing the wrong one and wondering why it wasn't working. So after I um, you know, spent 42 minutes <laughs> digging into figuring out what was going on, this also spurred on me to go and refactor this code and eliminate that duplicated copy. So um, so th this is sort of like the troubleshooting review stuff. So, so if, if I go and hit this start retro button, then Furby pops up and says, well, what made troubleshooting take so long? And what ideas do you have for improvement? And again, it's a prompt to kind of get you thinking and taking notes and capturing the, the lessons learned from each of these experiences. So you can get insights specifically on those kind of runtime behavioral experience sorts of things on what you can do for improvement. So um, this is also structured as a, a browser. So I can hit the back button here and then um, 
I got a little purple circle there showing that it's um, got an active retrocession going here. Those are retro in progress. Um, and then we can go back to, I want to show you what something looks like over the line. So if I have a troubleshooting session that is over 50 minutes, they'll show up as, as these red X's. So this basically just means these are things that we should probably have a conversation about, uh, you know, what the problem was and why it took so long to resolve. So um, they're kind of the, the outliers that are um, worth spending time talking about. Um, okay. So um, another really powerful tool that I want to show you um, designed to help you stay in the zone using um, a simple technique of intentionalizing your workflow. So we talked about the importance of clarity and getting your momentum going. So I'm going to change this to just be for demo. And what this is asking you here is what's your next intention? So the idea here is to clarify the thing you're about to do before you do it. So let's imagine I've got like a, a new, um, a new uh, page that I want to make create in the console for a new chart thing. So if I'm breaking down the work and thinking about, okay, what's the thing I'm going to do right now? I might go, okay, so I want to create a blank page, say. And then when I collapse my console, now in my little focus bar thing, I've got a reminder of what my current intention is, which helps me, one, stay focused, but also just this process of clarifying these little bits of work help us get the momentum going and stuff. So we get out of that kind of like um, staring mode and are able to clarify a concrete step that we can move forward with right then. And just this process of, of this, this rhythm of writing down the tension I'm gonna do like, okay, so that's my blank page. Then I'm gonna go um, create the new blank page. And then, okay, I got that down. Now um, I'm gonna you know create a new, empty chart, maybe. What's the next iterative little step that I would do, right? And then this one shows up. But this process of, of breaking down our work and clarifying with a sentence what we're about to do, just writing that out, externalizing that thought of our intention has a huge impact on our ability to get in flow more easily and stay in flow more easily. And just with this practice, I get way more done during the day. And, you know, when you look at the flow charts here of your flow for the day, you really start to see the impact of how these practices make a difference in your ability to sustain um, momentum. Um, so going back to Furby for a minute. So when you get to level seven, you also get some new skills. So um, Furby Neo skills. So you get you get sunglasses that go with your skills too. So Furby Neo, you earn 10% bonus XP when you learn the command line tools and receive badges for exploring new commands. And Furby Love, you earn 10% bonus XP when you help your teammates troubleshoot and receive badges for helping out. So I tried to come up with incentives that would um, be positive and you know alignment with uh, um, being contributing things for the team. So, and then you can put your sunglasses on and you can change your sunglasses color. Maybe we do some like bright yellow ones kind of thing. And so this, this, this team skill of helping your teammates troubleshoot. So um, the team collaboration is supported through the Furbies. So if you've been, um, you've been uh, troubleshooting a problem for over 20 minutes, um, your Furby can um, pop up and um, um, and will we'll gently, you know, ask if you could use some help. Or you can also bring up your Furby manually with a hotkey, which is what I just did. And, and um, with the flow feed coming in from the plugin, um, Furby knows uh, what area of code you're currently in, um, and historically, 
Um, who on your team is most familiar uh, with that area from um, just all the, the data history pulled together to be able to figure out who is most likely to be able to help with the particular problem that you're facing? And then Furby also knows whether the other developers on your team are, are deep in flow or not. Um, we've got this you know, real-time um, uh, detection of, of your flow state and your momentum as well. Um, and so um, you can reach out then without having to worry about whether you're uh, interrupting people and, and, um, and other people can on your, on your team can configure when they're okay uh, with Furby help requests. So, and then you get um, bonus XP for helping your teammates uh, troubleshoot. Um, so the, the Furby teams functionality um, gives you a flow state aware people orchestration system, essentially. Um, all right, so that is the demo of Flow Insight. Um, let's see. Do you have a, there's a few questions in the chat, some of them relating to this, uh, to this part, might be good to, to tackle them here. Uh, one was on the, uh, uh, when you're creating your troubleshooting session, you're leaving the notes to yourself. Is that something that is only you can see or, or is it part of the source code forever and everybody can see it? Where, how, uh, how does that work? Uh, so, uh, so the troubleshooting sessions are, um, you can see yourself. So they're your own notes. And then if um, you you do a Furby pairing with, uh, with Furby basically reaching out, it sends a link to your mm -hmm. troubleshooting session and then someone else can then go and join your troubleshooting session and it would operate just like chat. We're also okay. working on a Slack integration um, plugin that, um, so when you post things in here um, and you, let's say you're the only one on your team that, that has the tools installed, um, that uh, like you would have a, a, a troubleshooting channel and it would create a thread when you create a new troubleshooting session and sure. then comments would post a thread and then people could reply in Slack and then it would show up in the tools and be tracked along with the troubleshooting session as well. All right, cool. Uh, another one on the data that's been collected, not necessarily the troubleshooting, but on the, you know, we're keeping track of the, uh, you know, we did see the, the log where everything was getting, uh, getting put. Is there, uh, is that information just cached on the local machine or is there some, uh, back-end analytics system that uh, the data is also going to for uh, deeper analysis? Yeah, so um, uh, let me back out of here so you can kind of see it. So um, any of the plugins and, and um, that write to this particular active flow format, you could create your mm -hmm. own plugins if you wanted to instrument other, other tools and things too. Um, you write to this active flow file and all of these other directories for like pre-process, um, archive, publish queue, and so forth. The Flow Insight app sends those uh, to the server, and then um, all of the data that you see on, you know, in here from the aggregate analysis. And I didn't show, you know, the, there's a bunch of other, you know, reports and things um, mm -hmm. here as well. All of the data analytics and stuff, and turning this into uh, this uh, time phase feed, calculating the metrics, all of that is done um, server side. Um, the reason I put this uh, into a um, format like this was for a couple of reasons. Um, one is, is so that um, uh, like the developers can see all the data that's being collected from their machine explicitly. So the Flow Insight tools themselves don't have any sort of like embedded tracking or anything in them. Like the data that's being collected for the metrics is here transparently for everyone to see. Um, the Flow Insight console and the plugins, all of it's open source. So you can go look at the source code and make sure there's nothing weird in there, you know. Um, so I, I, I wanted to make it easy to extend so that, um, uh, you know, you can, you can add in your other sorts of events. So like, for mm -hmm. example, um, adding in um, um, like a, a Gradle plugin we started working on uh, recently to add in um, execution activity for, um, for running builds. Um, and anything that you can do a plugin and then write out JSON for, 
um, uh, you know, you can plug into your flow feed. So if I created a new plugin here, um, uh, it would it would uh, prompt you here saying, hey, I detected a new plugin in your directory. Would you like to register it? Um, and if you register it, then it'll start sending that data to the server. If you don't register it, it, it won't. Um, so that way, like nothing can suddenly appear in your directory and, mm -hmm. you know, um, showing up in your data too. But I mean, there's all kinds of reporting and things in here. So this is sort of like a, a code oriented view where you can um, drill all the way down into the um, code files. And so this is confusion, um, aggregated confusion across your, your code base. Okay. And then uh, I think there's just one more on the, on the, on the tool. The other ones we can ask uh, at the end. Uh, so there's one on the momentum, uh, capturing the momentum. Uh, you know, the, uh, it doesn't matter if, if you're a slow typer or a fast typer, does that affect how the momentum is, um, is calculated? Um, not really. Um, so I, I hand tuned a threshold of 150 keystrokes over 20 minutes, which is fairly low. And then mm -hmm. once you're over, over that threshold, it really doesn't, really doesn't, um, matter at all. Like it's, it's just, it, if you're over that threshold, momentum ticks up by one for each minute, basically. Um, okay. and, and so um, it's possible that that threshold might need to be tuned per person. Um, my goal with setting up a minimum threshold was uh, so that you could tell the difference between, like, if you just type a couple keys, if it's so hypersensitive that your momentum's going all the time, you don't really get a, a clean um, data signal. Um, yep. So um, smoothing out the data with a, a moving average and having kind of a minimum threshold until you're kind of, it detects that you're in a flow state. Um, and then once you're above that threshold, whether you're typing, you know, a, a, a thousand characters in 20 minutes, mm -hmm. or you're just at like 250, it really doesn't matter at all. Your momentum's going to go up just the same. Okay. Yeah, I got you. So it's a uh, 150 keystrokes in 20 minutes, which is not, it's not a, it's not a lot. It doesn't, Probably mean that you're actually doing something instead of uh, just clicking around and looking at files. Exactly. Uh, yeah. Okay. No. Oh, cool. All right. Yeah. So we'll save the other questions till the uh, till the end. We can we can take those there. All right. Well, I'm I'm um, more or less wrapped up. I was going to um, let's see. Um, so this is kind of my um, last slide here. So. Um, uh, thank you. I, I appreciate your time. I hope you enjoyed the presentation and um, learned some things, got some ideas. Um, I'm Artie Starr. Um, this is my book, Idea Flow. If you want to check that out, you can find it at leanpub.com forward slash idea flow. And if you're interested in um, the Flow Insight beta, um, uh, you can uh, find that at the QR code there for the beta sign up. And um, Otherwise, it's at flowinsight.com. You can uh, navigate there from the website as well. No, thank you. That's awesome. Uh, and I'll I'll grab the slides from you later. So we'll, uh, if you uh, you know if you come back to the event page and I'm going to go on PTO next week, so it'll probably I won't get it done uh, get it up before I go. So if you check back in a few weeks, I'll have the slides up. So if you didn't quite uh, catch the QR code right now or the links. Uh, they will be there, uh, and you'll get a everybody will get a, a wrap up email as a, a, a reminder. But that was definitely some interesting stuff. There are a few uh, uh, questions uh, left. Let me scroll back to the top. So we did have a, a question when you were in the uh, when you had the AR sunglasses on. A quick one there is what what uh, what's the name of the AR sunglasses that you uh, that you use? So. Um... They they were the N Real Air when I bought them, but they've rebranded to X Real. But um, they're three hundred something dollars that you can get. Um, and then, um, as I said, I, I really like these. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, like for watching movies on an airplane, I think they're also kind of a practical, cool thing. And then I also got a, a dedicated phone, so these don't have any batteries on them either. 
Um, okay. and, they, and you deploy apps with just like an Android uh, app, and then they run off the battery of, of an Android phone. So I, mm. I bought a dedicated phone to use with um, the, the sunglasses um, so that it wasn't, you know, draining off my, my main phone battery. And, sure. and um, if, I, if I watch a full-length movie at fairly high brightness, it runs my battery down about 30%. So, I mean, it's like the battery life um, and, you know, how much power they use. I mean, it's, it's, it's pretty doable. All right, cool. So the X, X real. Yeah. X real. Nice. Uh, And then uh, you're looking at the 3d visualizations. Uh, Jimmy Rusko is wondering, uh, you why not do 2d? Why not maybe Neo 4j? Uh, why add D3 processing 3GS? I don't know. I'm just reading off the thing. I'm not sure. Yeah. <laughs> it's, a, it's getting into an area that I'm not familiar with, but maybe maybe uh, you uh, you get the idea. Yeah. So like all of those libraries, like, and I mean, I do a lot of D3 visualization stuff too. Like the charts I was showing um, were primarily um, D3 uh, visualizations and D3 also has force directed uh, graph support uh, as well. So um, the reason for the, the uh, 3D visualization thing is that uh, the, the stereoscopic display of things being 3D in space gives you a sense of depth for sort of complex uh, connections and things. So uh, that, that you just um, uh, don't get a feel for it to the same degree in, in a 2D environment. So that's mm-hmm. one reason. The other is that we already have a whole lot of stuff going on on our screens and you've got a limited amount of screen real estate. And if I can put a sunglasses on, put sunglasses on and then be able to have this huge canvas of, I can have a, a whole planetarium around me of visualizations that I can go and look at. It, it's for a pair of sunglasses. Now I can have, you know, all of this, you know, extra space and screen real estate, um, as well as stereoscopic sca- capability to do some really cool stuff with. Um, so I, I think from a practicality perspective, those are some of the practical reasons. Um, I think another reason, though, that isn't necessarily pragmatic, but um, I, I think the technology is just fresh and fun and something different that breathes a little life back into the world too. Sure. Um, and, you know, if, if it costs, you know, $3,500 to breathe life into the world, it creates more of a barrier, but you know, I, I like something like this, I think is, is very uh, reachable as a potential platform that we could build on top of to create some, you know, just cool, different, fresh, new, um, visualizations and uh, interactive tools um, that could integrate with our coding environment. And that um, I think for like part-time use, like for a specialized task kind of thing, I think it's very feasible. No, yeah, uh, thanks for that. I think I've hit the questions in the Q&A chat and I'm not seeing any more in the uh, general chat. Uh, but I do, I do have one question that I ask all the presenters. It's not, it's not technical. It's maybe uh, if we have any uh, people earlier in their career starting out. Uh, so you've, uh, you know, obviously been, you know, experienced uh, technologist, been through, uh, been through life. If you could go back in time and tell uh, uh, your younger self some career advice, maybe twenty uh, year old Artie, is there anything? <laughs> Uh, in in particular that you would uh, that you would say, man, twenty year old Artie. <laughs> I would say, find the thing that lights you up and gives you joy and is and is fun, and figure out how to center around that and create more of that in your life. No, that's a, uh, uh, that's a, uh, that's a good one. Uh, yeah. To find that, uh, yeah. Find that thing that you can uh, drive towards. Yeah. That, uh, that, that thing that gives you joy. Yeah. So that's, uh, 
Because if, if it's giving you joy, you could probably not. Uh, you could probably work on it twenty-eight hours a day and not get tired of it. <laughs> All right, looking at the Q and A chat. Uh, Michelle says, "Yeah, find your joy and flow uh, towards that intention." Yeah, thanks, yeah. Uh, uh, Michelle. Yeah, Michelle, I think she's the f maybe the furthest away joiner today <laughs> from <laughs> Australia. Uh, we might have somebody from uh, from India today as well. I'm trying to remember some of the names of people that joined in the uh, in the past. Uh, but yeah, I think uh, really appreciate uh, uh, the look into what you've been dealing with. Uh, uh, it seems like there's a, a passion for uh, making, uh, you know, taking some of the frustration out of uh, developers' lives and uh, making them more productive. And by making them more productive, uh, you know, industries, whoever, is, whoever has developers, you know, they should get some uh, additional benefit from, uh, you know, from that uh, as well. So it's really uh, some cool, uh, uh, cool thinking going on here. Appreciate taking the time uh, uh, out of your summer to join us. Yeah, this is fun. Thank you. Appreciate you having me. <laughs>